It is my pleasure to invite you to our session of today, the third webinar of the series Pohled Zovni, a look from the outside. I am organizing on behalf of the Postgraduate Society of Kiev Mohyla Academy. The series is devoted to the Ukrainian topics in linguistics, geography, history, and political science, reflected in publications of prominent researchers who work in the US and UK academic environments. Our goal is to look at Ukrainian issues from the outside to enrich one's perspective with new approaches, methods, and say, way of thinking. We have two fantastic speakers, Professor Degan Krause and Professor Tim Houghton with us today. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Degan Krause, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Wayne State University, US. He is the author and co-author of several prominent books, including his first monograph, Collected Affinities, Democracy and Party, and competition in Slovakia and Czech Republic, published in 2006. He is a co-editor of a book, The Structure of Political Competition in Western Europe, which is 2010, and an author of a chapter on new dimensions of political cleavage in the Oxford Handbook of Political Science, published in 2007. Working in a comparative politics field, he focuses on European politics, political parties, democratic institutions, and national identity. His most recent book appeared in December 2020 and is called The New Party Challenge, Cycles of Party Birth and Death in Central Europe and Beyond. The book was written with Dr. Houghton of the University of Birmingham, UK, who kindly join us today. Among other things, his interest lies in electoral and party politics, electoral campaigning and their relationship between politics and government. He served as the director of the Center for Russian, European and Eurasian Studies from 2020 to 2012 to 2014 and is um, and was the head of the Department of Political Science and International Studies from 2016-2018. Now, Professor Deacon Krause has served as a consultant for the U.S. Department of State on the politics of Central Europe, and um, a book has become a result of his ongoing research on rise of new Central European political parties and transformation of established ones. And it is um, on this research, together with Professor Houghton, that we will be speaking today with the topic birth and death of political parties in Europe. Why so? Please. Thank you very much. And Oksana, thank you very much for all of the work that you've done in organizing this series. Uh, we've been in touch for quite some time. I'm also uh, delighted to congratulate you on your Fulbright. Those are not easy to get. Uh, and uh, uh, you're doing what sounds like really quite remarkable work. So, uh, and for those of you who are not on Fulbright, which I think most in the audience, I would really encourage you to think about this particular opportunity. I'm sure Oksana can, can talk to you about it in more detail, but uh, I hope your experience has been a good one, Oksana, and that um, others will be able to follow uh, in your footsteps. One of the nice things about my university is that it has the contract to um, provide orientations for students coming in. And so we see amazing groups of students every year. And I, I hope that some of you may in future be among that group as well. But let me stop talking. And I actually want to start by um, handing it over to uh, my, my colleague, Tim Houghton. Tim and I uh, have developed over time a kind of rhythm in how we talk about our book. Um, the book is one of the most mutual academic experiences I've ever had. Really, there's, there's no page of our book that is one of us or the other of us. We've really worked very, very closely together. And it's, it's my delight to have such a, a, an amazing co-author. And, and again, to those of you out there, I, I hope that you have the same luck uh, in finding uh, other scholars that you can work with. Two heads or three or four is always better uh, than one. 
And let me first ask for just a quick uh, thumbs up if uh, you can see uh, on the screen a very bright pink book. Can you all see that? Yes, excellent. Okay, so with that administrative duty out of the way, I'm going to hand it over to uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Houghton. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's almost uh, good evening, I guess, in Kiev, and it's good morning for those of you on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, but Jakuyu, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to um, to do this now. Uh, Kevin and I both know that everyone is pretty zoomed out these days, um, so we're going to try to do our best to make uh, our presentation as uh, interesting, informative uh, as possible. Uh, to try to mitigate against all of those more boring uh, Zoom meetings that we all attend these days. So uh, we, our comments are based on uh, this book um, and um, uh, the New Party Challenge, which as Oksana was very kind enough to mention, uh, was published back in um, December last year. Okay, and so, um, uh, indeed, we want to extend a thank you for the, uh, a big Jakuyu, uh, if I get my Ukrainian right. Uh, thank you for um, uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. Now, our book um, actually begins with a story, uh, a fairy story. So um, with your indulgence, uh, we're going to begin this presentation with me reading from the book. So once upon a time, there was a king who created a new political party, which he named after himself. He promised to clean up the country's politics, won more votes than anyone else, and became prime minister. But politics did not get much cleaner, and he did not win as many votes the next time. Almost no one lived happily ever after, except for his bodyguard, who created his own new party, promised to clean up the country's politics, won a lot of votes, and became prime minister. In a nearby country, there was a game show host who created a new political party. He dressed in funny outfits in campaign advertisements as a convict, a madman, a vampire and a courtesan, in which he promised to clean up the country's politics. He won a large number of votes and became Speaker of Parliament. But politics did not get much cleaner and his party fell apart when he was photographed drinking happily with a local organised crime family. In a third country, not far away, there was a supermarket chain manager who became a big city mayor and created a new political party named after himself. He promised to clean up the country's politics and got more votes than anyone else. But politics did not get much cleaner and his party fell apart when he was accused of corruption and he did not win many votes the next time. One person who did was a prominent yet apolitical magistrate who formed a new political party named after himself, promised to clean up the country's politics, won more votes than anyone else and became prime minister. But that apolitical magistrate saw his popularity fall. And at the next election, a comedian turned mayor who formed a new party named after himself, promised to clean up the country's politics and became prime minister. Finally, in yet another country located in between the three others, there was a fresh faced politician from an established party who did not get a position he thought he deserved. He created a new party, promised to clean up the country's politics and won a large number of votes. But when he did not get to be prime minister, he reorganized his party, built a strong organization and promised to help those who were struggling economically. The next time he got more votes than anyone else and became prime minister and his party remained strong and powerful for a long, long time until voters started to notice how corrupt it had become and started to look around for a different, fresh-faced politician who would clean up the country's politics. So that's the way that we start our book, uh, a fairy story, you might say. Well, actually, since um, uh, completing um, the book, um, this we could have written new, new, uh, set, uh, new um, uh, uh, lines to that particular story, because actually since then, in, in one of those particular cases, there's been this politician, Slavi Trifonov, who has um, burst through uh, to um, 
uh, into Bulgarian politics at the last Bulgarian elections. So we should probably thank whoever manages or controls the universe for um, continuing to show that the kinds of stories that we find in the politics of um, Central and Eastern Europe um, continue to deliver these kinds of narratives. Um, and this particular um, politician, Slavi Trifonov, really illustrates um, what we argue in, in our book, The New Party um, Challenge. So Kevin, can you? Yeah, I, I think there's a lag, just a slight lag. Do you see Slavi and? Uh... Yeah, okay. So the, um, the book that, um, that, we, that we wrote, we really called it the New Party Challenge for three reasons. So firstly, it represents the challenge post, placed by, uh, or the challenge posed by new parties to the established parties within the system. But secondly, it's also about the challenge faced by those new parties, not just to start up, but then to actually keep going, to endure. And then finally, um, it's about the new challenge that all parties are facing in a period of rapid change, uh, particularly in technology, but also in finance and in, and in political identities um, as well. Crucially, one of the core arguments um, that we want to make, or we make in the book, is to um, argue that um, new parties die quickly, but the species of new parties endures, because we suggest that newness is endogenous to the system. Now, briefly, just to say something about the research upon which our arguments in the book is based. So our research is a combination of both qualitative and quantitative approaches. On the qualitative side, we undertook um, interviews, uh, over a couple of hundred interviews with um, party officials and activists uh, in 11 countries across Central and Eastern Europe, visiting the party offices. Here's a couple of examples from Lithuania and from Slovakia. Um, but in addition to that, we also um, use quantitative tools, uh, databases, um, those um, of the Chapel Hill Expert Survey, of um, the Raw Schneider Whitefield Survey, the terrific work by scholars like uh, Sarah Engler, plus our own um, uh, uh, database that we collated as we were putting it together. And we engaged in some um, number crunching. Uh, and indeed even some, some simulation activities, which Kevin will talk about briefly uh, in the second half of the presentation. So this is the kind of structure of the book and what we'll be, um, we'll be talking about uh, over the course of the next um, half an hour or so. Now, the first question that, that you may ask is, well, what do we mean by uh, newness and new parties? Now, coming from uh, a country like the UK, these kinds of questions are often thought to be relatively straightforward. But anyone who knows anything about the um, politics of Central and Eastern Europe, where we've seen lots of fissions and fusions, lots of split splinters, mergers, et cetera, et cetera, that actually what counts as a new political party is not necessarily that straightforward. Um, what we would say is that our research shows two things. One, that it does, in certain senses, make sense to, to um, identify clearly what we mean by newness. And here we look at both the origins of a party, so where the parties come from, um, the, the origins of that party, but also the attributes that that party has. And we can use that to uh, measure and assess the degrees of novelty. And that can be very helpful. But also what we found in a lot of our research is that some of the key measures that we did, it didn't really matter uh, whether we took a very strict or a very um, loose uh, uh, understanding of novelty that the broad trends tended to be shown. Uh, so um, we're very happy to come back and talk more in Q&A about uh, this issue of newness. It's quite, it can be quite a nerdy topic. So uh, that's all we'll say at this particular point. But the next um, aspect that we want to um, look at is um, one of the things that we tried to do in the book, which was to try to actually map out the party systems of 11 states. So we took basically the 11 states of Central and Eastern Europe, um, uh, taking uh, 
um, countries like, for example, here's the case of Slovakia, mapping out the party system in Slovakia. So here we can see there's some quite complicated party systems with party, a party system with, with parties coming and going. Um, Slovakia, I've argued uh, many times, is sort of stable in its instability. That's the case of Slovakia, one of the cases, the four cases that we talked about earlier. A second case would be the Lithuanian one. Uh, so um, uh, when I was talking about the um, game show host, uh, that was uh, an example from the Lithuanian case. We can see in Lithuania the emergence of a number of new parties uh, in Lithuania. A third case that we could uh, look at here is the Bulgarian case, um, uh, that one of, of Slavi Trifonov, but also the story that we began with about the king uh, and the bodyguard that's taken from the experience of Bulgaria. And what's interesting in the Bulgarian case um, is Bulgaria really brings out many of the uh, key questions that were a heart of our research. So we were interested in looking at why lots of new parties emerged. So that was part of our kind of explanation or part of our drive. Secondly, we were interested to try to understand why quite a lot of those parties didn't survive um, for very long. Thirdly, we were interested to understand why, however, some of those new parties, a very few of them, but some new parties did manage to endure uh, over time. And finally, we're also interested in why in amongst all of this turmoil, this churn, um, that some parties were able to endure um, uh, right from the 89 revolutions up through until the present day. Okay, and this is where um, I'm gonna pass over to, to the awesome Kevin Deegan Krauss and Kevin uh, will talk a little bit more about the mapping and measuring uh, and the central arguments of the book. So over to you, Kevin. Great, thank you, Tim. So just one note uh, that I would, would raise, um, and uh, I'm, I realize that maybe for, a, for an outside audience, it's not always so obvious uh, how these maps work, um, but what we've tried to do in these maps, and really what was our inspiration, uh, was to think about how political party systems evolved over time. So each of these lines, these horizontal lines, represents a political party, and they're about as thick as the party's vote share in, in particular elections. So you can see in Bulgaria, some of the parties, like the Bulgarian Socialist Party, the red line, continue all the way through, often in large coalitions and so on, um, or like the Movement for Rights and Freedoms, the, the largely Turkish ethnic party, um, but that some parties come and go very quickly. Some parties even stay, but not very many. Uh, and many of the parties that start at the beginning end up sort of falling into, into insignificance. Uh, and one of the things that I've tried to do, and I, I have to admit, I haven't fully uh, completed it yet because uh, of the complexity of it, it would be to think about what this kind of map would look like for Ukraine. Um, because you have in Ukraine in the beginning, uh, in the beginning, a, a system with lots of, of political parties um, that narrowed down uh, in the kind of middle period uh, to a few parties and then through a series of uh, kind of chaotic reversals and turns, um, uh, we're now in a situation where there is more, both more fragmentation and more change again. And so many of the parties in Ukraine's parliament right now are not the parties that were there in the previous cycle, which were not the ones there in the previous cycle before that. Um, and so we feel very much um, like our research, uh, while we didn't do it specifically in Ukraine, um, we did it in the 11 post-communist countries now in the European Union, uh, we feel like there is quite a, a relevance to what we're, we're, we're doing. Uh, and that's why we wanted to talk to you about this, uh, in part to share with you what we found in our research, uh, and in part to ask your thoughts and opinions about what whether we're finding in the rest of Central and Eastern Europe uh, actually applies to uh, Ukraine as well. From an outsider's perspective, it really looks like the Ukrainian party system uh, follows the same kind of uh, shattering and constant reconstruction from we see in any of the countries. In addition, however, to these maps, which are uh, very idiosyncratic, they change from country to country. What we wanted to try and do was to make comparisons about the amount of newness and new political parties 
across multiple countries. Each of these maps is sort of like looking at a map uh, of the, the agricultural patterns of a particular country or uh, ethnic composition. Each one of these is going to be different. So how do we compare? So what we've actually tried to do is to try to take these very descriptive maps and turn them into quantitative measurements. Uh, and so toward that end, what we started to do, as Tim mentioned, um, was to try and define what it means to be a new party or not. And as Tim said, um, in many countries like Britain, um, it's very clear when a party is new, it's new. Um, so for example, the UK Independence Party uh, was a new, a new political party. Um, but even then it becomes kind of complicated because shortly after its creation, the UK Independence Party collapsed uh, and it was replaced in many ways by a party with the same leader, but a different name, the Brexit Party. Uh, and so as political scientists, we need to ask, is this the same party as it was before? And as looking at the, at the Ukrainian case, I mean, we have multiple different examples uh, of parties that change their name, like the Poroshenko Bloc has changed its name, uh, but other parties that have gone through multiple different kinds of evolutions over time. Um, so our Ukraine evolved over time into others, people left and came from various parties. So what we needed to do was to create some fairly standard definitions for how to decide what belongs as a new party and what does not. And we can talk about those. One of the things we then did, once we set those levels, and we created multiple different levels of newness so we could try it saying, if we're very strict about what's new, what are the numbers like? If we're, we're very loose about what's new, what do the numbers look like? All of the figures that I'll present to you really here are from that mi a middle level. So a kind of not too strict, not too, too loose measure of what can we consider new. And mainly what we mean are parties that are created afresh by, by new, new political leaders. So like Golos would be an example, but also parties that are the result of, of what we call fissions or splits or splinters. Um, and certain kinds of mergers, especially when several equally sized parties merge into the same, uh, into, a, into a common group. So that's what you'll see when, when you look at these measurements. And then what we did was to break the time period and break the parties into five-year groupings. So in, in our book spans a 30-year period. Um, and so given the, the fall of communism in most countries around 1990, we actually started to look at uh, five-year periods beginning with the zeros and the fives. Um, and then we allotted parties to those time periods based on when they were created, when they became new. And what you see when you look at this map is that in the first period that we're discussing, so 1990 to 1994, we consider every party as new, even communist parties, which had continued over because they now suddenly had to face in a completely new environment of electoral competition. We, we considered them as starting, uh, starting new. By the second five-year period, you can see those new parties, the parties that were created in the first period, those parties now accounted for only about 80% of the total vote, which means that 20% of the parties in that second period were parties created in that second period. So new parties from that period. By the third period, the parties created initially from 1990 to 94, it dropped to under 60% of the total vote. The parties created from 1995 to 99 were now only about 10%. And so a new group of parties emerged that were created in this period. And we see this pattern in every single period that went from there. So in every period, each of the cohorts shrunk and created space for a new cohort uh, created in that later, in that later period. So by, by, by the period of 2015 to 2019, we have a sets of parties that were created, some at the very beginning, some in that second period, some in the third period, some in the fourth, some in the fifth, and then again, always the creation, the emergence of new political parties. Uh, and those emergences were always somewhere between 20 and 10% of the overall uh, composition of the party system at any, at any given time. So what we saw was a kind of process of compression Older parties would shrink down, newer parties would land on top, uh, and there was always new parties. There were always new people to come in and replace or force out uh, some, of the, some of the older parties. And with this actually disaggregated, so now each of these I, I'm looking at individually on its own, we see a remarkable pattern. 
in that every single cohort in this system, every group of parties, whether created in the first five years or the second or the third, every single cohort received fewer votes in the next period than they did in the previous one. And that was true for every single party in every single period. So we see this declining chart in everyone. And I have to say, when Tim and I began this research, we did not expect our data to come out this cleanly, to come out this neatly. But there is a constant process in Central Europe of new parties displacing old parties and old parties getting fewer and fewer votes than they, than they did before and new, new space being created for, for new political parties. And this pattern isn't just an aggregate pattern that maybe is driven by one or two countries. It actually is a pattern that we see across the board. Now the patterns can look slightly different. So here's the average pattern that I showed you. In some countries, you see um, a, a really strong dominance of the, of the old parties until there is a break. So countries like Romania or the Czech Republic or Croatia, uh, where the initial formed party stayed strong for quite some time, uh, and then other countries we mentioned like Slovakia or like Latvia, where the new parties almost immediately gave way to newer parties, and those almost immediately gave way to even newer ones. So when Tim talks about a stable instability, uh, that's what we see in those countries. But the same pattern is true across the board uh, in, in every single one of these, of these countries. So this helped us compare countries across the board, but we still needed to go one step further and create a kind of quantitative measurement. We like to have some numbers behind what we're doing. So what we actually did was to use the work of uh, some American and Estonian scholars um, to calculate what we call the average party system age. So in other words, at any given election, you add up the, the share of vote that a party got and the age of that party. So, you know, in a, in a system like the United States, the average age of, a, of the political parties is really the age of the, of the system as a whole because the parties were established very, very long ago. In a country like Slovakia or a country like Bulgaria, the average age is very, very low actually uh, because there are many, many new parties. So parties with a very small age actually play a very large role uh, in the overall uh, political party, party system. So we calculated that age, and this is the average for the region. What we found was um, that the party systems never grew as, as fast as the systems themselves aged. Uh, in other words, if parties were established here and those same parties continued to dominate the system, you would see this diagonal line. So at five years, the party system would be five years old. At 25 years, the party system would be 25 years old. Um, what we actually see is that the average party systems in the region uh, ended up uh, really at about half the age of the actual time that had elapsed in that period. And you can see the multiple different lines here. Those lines actually rep represent what we talked about earlier, the stricter or looser estimation. So if, even if we take a kind of looser estimation about what is new, um, we don't get a much younger system. And if we have a much stricter definition of what's new, we don't get a much older party system. And so that was our way of checking our data to make sure that this wasn't being driven by just one or two political parties. And when we look at this more broadly, what we see again is that virtually every system in the, in the region um, is somewhere short of that line. Now, some countries, like I mentioned, like the Czech Republic, they got old at the rate of the system getting old, but until a certain break point. So in the Czech Republic, um, it was the elections of uh, 2010. Um, in Romania, it was similar elections from that same period and the same for, for Croatia. In Slovenia, it was the elections of 2011. Whereas other countries like Slovakia uh, have been getting, have been staying young the whole time. They've never been getting older. Uh, Tim and I like to joke as two sort of aging academics, uh, these party systems seem to have found that fountain of youth that everyone looks for. Um, we have not yet succeeded in that same uh, goal as our appearances will, will tell you. Once we what we do a little bit of guessing about why this happened, why, why it would look this way. 
Um, and so we started to look intensively at the political parties, at those new political parties and trying to compare them to the other ones, the ones that, that lasted much longer. And this may actually be interesting and relevant um, for the Ukrainian system to say, okay, of those parties, the relatively few parties uh, in Ukraine that have remained stable for a fairly long uh, period of time, now, obviously, some of those parties have undergone changes, but you know, you see the party of, of uh, 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 Timoshenko, for example, continuing over time. Not too many others that have continued over time, frankly. How do those parties differ from the newer parties um, that are that are being established? And that might lend us some some idea about why these parties succeed, why they fail, and and if you're interested in stopping the cycle, what that would look like. What we did then was to look at these parties on the basis of a number of different characteristics that we found to be very important. So we looked at party organization, uh, we looked at the issues that parties argued about, and we looked at the nature of the leadership in those parties. And we tended to find that these three factors played quite a strong role. And when we looked at organization, what we found was that parties were quite different. Uh, some parties were quite strong. They had branches, they had members who were actively engaged, they had party offices at regional levels and so on. Uh, other parties were quite weakly organized. They didn't really have a physical infrastructure. Um, they didn't really even have members. They just had people who went to their web pages or occasionally came to their rallies. We also found differences among parties about the kinds of issues that they debated. Some parties um, were advocates of particular issues that we argue have a, a long shelf life, that, that those issues are um, kind of enduring over time. And those are standard questions of economics or of cultural minorities or cultural majorities, but that other parties uh, tended to focus on questions that we call rather ephemeral, having a, a short shelf life, and especially uh, those are issues of corruption. Um, it's actually in most countries of the region um, very difficult uh, to maintain a consistent, coherent position on corruption over time uh, because uh, parties that argue against corruption very often get into power and then find themselves uh, facing those exact same temptations for corruption. And even if they don't become corrupt, people assume that if you were in politics, you were corrupt. So even if those parties manage to actually remain clean, people rarely think of them. Uh, as remaining clean. And I would be very interesting uh, to, uh, to see your reactions about uh, how, you know, a party like Servant of the People for Servant of the People, for example, um, is viewed um, in the sense that it begins as a party that, that makes strong claims to being clean and disconnected. Um, but over time, it starts to lose its popularity as people associate it rightly or, or wrongly with that same kind of corruption. Uh, and then the last thing we found was a significant difference in parties according to their leadership. We found some parties where they were able on a regular basis to uh, engage in leadership change, um, to remove old leaders or have old leaders follow a regular cycle of, of retirement and to be succeeded by new parties uh, compared to other parties where it seemed there was no way to get the, the leader out of the party, that the only way to get the leader out was to split away from the party or for the party to be somehow destroyed or, or eliminated. Um, so we found these differences among political parties. Uh, and then we found that those differences were very strongly related to when the parties were created. Um, we found that the parties that were, were created earlier um, were more likely to uh, have these particular elements. Either they started that way or they learned how to do this over time. Uh, whereas the parties that were created later tended uh, to look like this. They tended to be weaker in terms of organization and, and to focus on corruption and other ephemeral issues uh, and be very, uh, they, found, they found it difficult to change their leader. The parties are fragile enough that they can't necessarily um, make those leadership uh, changes that might save them in the longer, in the longer run. We also did one more kind of analysis uh, and what we found was that those same characteristics that we associate with older parties, uh, the stronger organization, the more durable issues, and the, and the changing leadership actually is what keeps those parties alive over time. Uh, whereas we found really quite strong relationships between weak organization and party, early party death, uh, between those ephemeral issues like corruption and early party death, 
The only place where we didn't see that the characteristics of new parties, that leadership focus, uh, had an unambiguous effect on uh, the party survival uh, was the question of leadership. So, you know, with this one, we say the kind of it's a it's a it's a ticking clock. It's an open question. In some parties, uh, a strong leader has actually managed to survive in charge of the party for some time. Although what we're seeing now in Slovakia, in 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 Bulgaria, is that even the strongest and in some ways the most effective political leaders. Uh, still manage if they can't change themselves uh, to, to potentially uh, cause death for their own political parties over time. The last thing that I want to say before handing it back to Tim um, is that in addition to looking at the broad uh, questions about what causes parties to survive and, and fail, um, is a deeper question about what causes new parties to emerge and to continue to emerge over time. So why would you see a system where there were new parties and then newer parties and then even newer parties? Um, and here we've taken to talking about what we call cycles and subsystems. And this is related to our initial claim that there is what we call endogeneity. There is a kind of internal causal process that it, it, it actually gives birth to its own successors, um, that it causes in a way itself. Um, and what we found when we looked at different party systems uh, around the world um, was that um, there was a kind of cycling of, of new political parties so that a political party would emerge uh, into the system. It would often claim to be the anti-corruption party. They would claim that all of the other parties in the system, whether they were left or right or nationalist or cosmopolitan, that they were all corrupt. And the new party would emerge somewhere in the middle of the political system, say what's important is corruption, and we're the only non-corrupt party because we're so new, we, we haven't had a chance to be corrupt. Uh, but what we found over time uh, was that almost all of those parties ending up end up in the middle or at the far end. They end up just as corrupt perceived as the others or even more corrupt than the others. Uh, and, um, and so they lose that position, which creates a new space for a new political party. So in one way, there is a kind of regeneration process because new parties emerge to fill a space, but they can't hold on to that space. Uh, and so when they die or shift, that space becomes open and uh, viable for a new political party, which then experiences that exact same development uh, and creates yet another space. And we found that this pattern existed, but beyond that, we actually found that it wasn't just a situation of a new party emerging um, while the voters go with the other party, we actually found that many of the voters are the, are, are the same. And this really relates to what we argue is a new way of thinking about new political parties. Because up until the work that we started to do, and it's not just us, it's a lot of people who study Central and Eastern Europe as well as Latin America and so on. There were two things that happened to new political parties. In some systems, new political parties emerged they proved unsuccessful or successful quite briefly, uh, and then they died. And so the system kind of went back to the way it was before. Uh, and one of the examples we like to cite is the example of the New Democrats in Sweden. Uh, the New Democrats emerged. They were like the parties that we look at, the result of kind of an entrepreneur. They argued that they were cleaner, that the other parties were all corrupt and so on. Um, and that party did fairly well in one election. And then when it didn't, um, it disappeared and the space was filled in by all of the other older parties. So the voters just went back to where they came from. The other thing that's often happened um, in, in countries is that a new party emerged actually as itself in the system. Um, and so, you know, the example we, we like to cite here uh, is the example of a party called D66 uh, in, in the Netherlands. So interestingly, D66 is one of those parties um, that uh, has the number, the year of its birth in the name. Now, Tim and I like to joke that in, in Central Europe, that, that date is almost like an expiration date that you might find on a package of yogurt. That once you put the date on a party, that party isn't going to last very long. Interestingly, D66 in the Netherlands defied that trend. So they were created in 1966, and they're still around uh, 50 years later. Uh, they're still uh, in, the, in the, the Dutch political system, um, but they became to be regarded as one of the most established parties actually in the system. So uh, they did quite well in the most recent elections, and they're quite stable uh, over time. The example that's different is what we've been finding in Central Europe, and frankly, as Tim will discuss, 
increasingly around the rest of the world, is that it's not that new parties come and go, leaving the system the way it was before, like a ripple thrown into the, the ocean, or that new parties come and stay like an island that stays up, uh, but what you get is a constant series of change. So that a party will emerge and it will die, but another new party will emerge to fill its space and it will die, and another new party will emerge, and I could keep going on and on and on. In some of the countries we're looking at, we've seen this cycle happen four or now five times. Uh, and so this is the kind of, 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 of phenomena that we see. And so we've actually called this a, a subsystem. Party subsystems are not a new thing. And we often talk about the conservative party subsystem in France, uh, or we talk about the ethnic party subsystem in a country like uh, Slovakia or Romania. But this kind of subsystem is a subsystem that exists not all at the same time among certain groups of voters, but over time. So one party uh, gives uh, birth to another party, which gives birth to another party, uh, and so on. It's a little bit like if you think of team sports, um, you know, some team sports like basketball have all of the team members on the court at the same time. Other team sports have a series of players who play one after the other, like a relay race. Uh, and in this sense, we argue that uh, the new parties follow that kind of relay race pattern. Each party comes. Uh, they, they, they stumble, they hand the, the torch of the new party on to the next one, and it keeps going on and on and on. And rather than just hypothesizing this, we actually did quite a bit of research looking at the flows of voters. What we found, and I'll be very curious to hear your experience of this in Ukraine, uh, was significant flows of voters directly from one new party to the, to the next newer party. Uh, so this is the example of the of the Czech Republic uh, in the 19 uh, in the 2010 election. We had a huge uh, inflow of new political parties, which didn't do very well. Um, some of them survived, but many of them did not. And their voters ended up. Some of them went back to older parties. Some of them left the electorate, uh, but many of them went on to the next newer party, uh, and those had that same effect. They went on to the next newer party uh, and to the next newer party. Uh, and so this is the kind of phenomena that we see uh, over time uh, with, the, um, with, the, with the voters in the Czech Republic. We see an even in some ways more striking example in, in uh, Slovenia, uh, where you have four waves of new political parties, each one newer than the last, and each of the older waves end up dying out. Um, and so we see that pattern there. Um, and uh, so we, we see this pattern and we see the fact that in a whole variety of ways, newness creates even more newness, which for an example like Ukraine um, does suggest that the, the recent outbursts of new political parties don't produce a kind of settling down, but in fact produce yet more uh, incentives for new parties to form uh, and so on. But I'll be very curious to know what you think. In addition to looking at Central and Eastern Europe, however, uh, we started to, to find the same patterns uh, in, in other places as well. And actually, Ukraine plays a, a small role in our book, but so do a variety of other countries. And so I want to hand it back to Tim uh, to talk about the bigger ramifications. This isn't just about Central Europe and the bigger consequences, because it's not just uh, about kind of random numbers of political parties, that the change in political parties has significant consequences. Uh, and so to think about those consequences, I will hand it over to Tim. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Uh, conscious uh, that we've been talking for quite a long time, so I'll keep this uh, relatively brief, uh, but happy to come back and explore this in more detail uh, in Q&A um, if people are interested. So indeed, the last two chapters of the book, basically, firstly, we try to look and see where these kinds of phenomena are happening elsewhere. Uh, so we suggest that uh, it's not just the case that um, it's happening uh, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we also point to the fact that it's happening in uh, Western Europe um, as well. And one example that we draw on in particular, um, the case of Iceland. Uh, Iceland is, is very striking. If we look at the party map of Iceland, you can see uh, on the right hand side of that map, the emergence of quite a lot of new parties, many of which don't seem to uh, survive for very long. So that kind of subsystem seems to be in operation if we look at the Icelandic case. And indeed, if we look at the um, uh, uh, flows of voters, we can see a similar kind of pattern to that, what, that uh, which we uh, saw in both um, 
Slovenia and the Czech Republic, for example. But it's not just the case that we think that we see parallels uh, in um, Slovenia. Um, we uh, suggest, or actually we just throw this out for debate and discussion, we think that there may be some interesting parallels in the um, Ukrainian case. If we were doing the story for Ukraine, we might talk about uh, the chocolate king um, uh, rather, than the, um, rather than the Bulgarian king coming back. Um, and following on from uh, Poroshenko, we might then point to the fact that, of course, uh, in recent times, uh, we've seen the emergence of an apolitical actor, a servant of the people, uh, coming to uh, become a president. This seems to be almost straight out of the kind of new party handbook that we see from the countries of um, Central and Eastern Europe. So we see parallels in Ukraine, but neither Kevin nor myself would claim expertise in Ukraine. So we uh, are looking forward to hearing whether you think that these sorts of patterns that we've talked about um, are the same in, um, in Ukraine um, or not. But it's not just Ukraine, um, very briefly, just to emphasize that we we argue that we can find echoes of the kinds of processes that we're seeing. In other words, new parties being formed, often with a recipe of anti-corruption, of um, novelty and of celebrity, that these new parties do not endure for very long and that they then get replaced by even newer parties. And we seem to see this at least strong echoes of this in virtually all uh, continents on the globe, apart from Antarctica, which doesn't really have much of a party system. Um, and so we think that the region of Central and Eastern Europe, this is an important point for us and an important point for uh, you as scholars from Ukraine, is that we think the region isn't just one for um, theory testing, but actually it's where theory generation, that we can generate theories based on the experiences uh, of um, the countries that we look at. We don't always have to apply Western theories. And the final chapter of the book seeks to answer the question, well, so what? Why should we care about this kind of thing? And what we want to suggest is, is to look at what it means really for democracy. Now, on the one hand, we could argue the emergence of lots of new parties is a good thing. Um, it shows that the systems are um, responsive. Um, they can remove the corrupt from power. They can re-engage citizens in the political process and can actually re-engage and re-energize those parties in the establishment. The problem, however, with that is that those new parties can then become the very corrupt politicians they want to replace. They can cause disillusionment rather than um, re-energizing uh, the citizens. And indeed, they can simply just replace um, the establishment. On the negative side, um, and, and here the distinction between responsive and responsible, I should say, comes from Peter Mayer, um, we might suggest here that the problem with um, new parties, uh, critically to do with new parties, is often that um, these new parties are set up with, with, with short time horizons. And and very and longer time horizons are really important, not just for the health of democracy, but also for the generation of high quality public policy. So these shortened time horizons of new parties, we suggest, is a kind of concern. And that leaves um, that leads us then to um, question and think about the challenges to democracy. And obviously in our book, um, we focus primarily on those 11 states of Central and Eastern Europe. Ukraine, alas, only uh, gets a very brief mention. Um, but after having now uh, outlined what we thought, what we think is the kind of new party challenge in those 11 states, uh, we now set ourselves up for the challenge of trying to answer your questions. So I apologize that we've uh, probably exceeded our time a little bit. Um, but we hope um, that you found it an interesting um, and informative talk, and we're very happy to try and answer any questions you may have. So, Yaku. Um, fascinating. That was that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, may I remind you, you can use our chat window if you have questions, or you can ask them directly by raising your hand. And um, while you are thinking, I'll start with a question from our Google form. Uh, we have 
the two. So the first is um, some perspective Ukrainian political parties of liberal and Christian democratic orientations uh, fell rather quickly after their post maiden rise. Among them are pro-Western parties such as Self-Help, Samopomich, uh, Democratic Alliance, and uh, Power of the People. Uh, party voice, Holos, may soon repeat their fate. Did you follow the evolution of these parties and what, in your opinion, are, this, are the reasons for their decline? So this is the question from our audience. Um, that's fantastic. So we, we you know, we, we spent some time um, in the book uh, looking at, um, at, at Ukraine. Uh, Tim actually looked at virtually every country in the world as, as we, were, we were doing this and, uh, and Ukraine actually made it in. We focused, um, I think because of the, um, the, the re remarkableness uh, to which um, uh, the presidential races in Ukraine have followed our pattern. We tended to focus on that. Uh, so we didn't focus as much on um, parliamentary elections, but uh, the more I look, uh, and thanks in part to Oksana for making this possible so that I could actually have an excuse to look inside uh, of, of the Ukrainian party system, uh, the more I, I see that we, we should, in our future work, spend considerable time looking at, at Ukrainian parties because the, the patterns are really quite remarkable. I just took your, you know, the, the 2016 or 2014 and 2019 elections, um, you know, and the, the degree of, of continuity is really, um, is, you know, is really quite, uh, quite, quite low. I mean, there are some parties that sort of repeat from, from one to the other, but often with significant changes. Um, and that party change um, is what actually what we see in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, it's almost always lower. So when a new party emerges, um, you know, there are other countries and other places and other time periods where what you see is new parties emerge and they, they build some energy and excitement. And then they, they come back around to the next election and they get a few more votes and then a few more votes. Um, you know, my experience in, of, of, of what's going on in Central Europe and my initial indications of what we're seeing in Ukraine is the pattern that are, are quite similar, that um, often the, the first election is a party's best. Uh, and then it, it it declines from there. So for Samopomich, for example, um, you know you see a you see a decline for for Golos. If you look at the um, the public opinion polls, uh, servant of the people, you're following that same kind of, of pattern. And so um, what we haven't done is to look inside the political parties to look and see whether they have the kinds of organizational and um, Personnel and issue and issue -ish problems that we see with, uh, you know, the typical collapsing new party, um, and in fact, you know, some of the examples that you, that you give, I mean, you know, a, a more Christian democratic approach um, is actually in other countries fairly consistent with an ongoing stability. Um, so you might have expected to see that party staying stronger. It's interesting too that uh, you even see a decline uh, in uh, Svoboda. Um, you know, quite often uh, a nationalist position is quite consistent with some degree of, of party stability. Um, and so, you know, in many cases, the new parties that survive are often the far right parties. Um, but we don't see that necessarily in the Ukrainian example. Um, but I have to say that actually may not be that unusual because in the last 10 years, uh, what we've seen is that actually uh, even radical right parties don't seem immune to this, that uh, there seems to be enough institutional instability uh, among radical right parties that uh, in countries like Greece and Slovakia um, and, and uh, Estonia and elsewhere, uh, even the parties which should be anchored in a particular position, uh, those parties uh, don't necessarily survive. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if that answers the question. Our initial view is that uh, it seems like many of those same patterns uh, survive and that the, the newer Ukrainian parties are uh, similarly situated with regard to weak organization, with regard to, uh, you know, not long enduring issues and with regard to kind of a leadership focus. Uh, and that makes them quite weak, quite likely to die to be replaced by newer ones. Tim, did you have any thoughts on this? I would, uh, no, I mean, I, I think I would just add that we would be interested to know whether 
these issues of um, or the, these these factors of um, organization of the kinds of appeals and of the role played by the political leader in these parties that we find in Central and Eastern Europe, whether that may hold the key to explaining um, the cases in Ukraine. I think the other thing to say, um, something that, that Kevin mentioned that I think worth emphasizing is, you know, it's become even so much easier to create a new political party, but because it's become so much easier, it's then in many respects even harder to then uh, ensure that that party will endure, particularly in this kind of era uh, in which we all have much shorter uh, attention spans, thanks to digital technology and the like, and that we expect much, much more kind of immediate returns. And politics is really hard and politics is difficult um, and uh, it's difficult to deliver um, positive uh, responses really quickly. So I think that's all I would just add to what Kevin uh, said. Thank you. Thank you. I think that this uh, um, answers the question. And we have the second one. How important for Ukraine is to have in Parliament party with old history and fixed values as conservative party in Britain, Britain's Parliament? Well, I, I guess I should probably take that one as the Brit. Um, um, so, well, there is there are advantages and disadvantages in having um, uh, parties like the Conservative Party, not just in Parliament, but in government. Um, uh, and we can see uh, those positives and negatives in British history over the last few years. What, what I would say is um, one of the advantages of a party like that, let's Let's think of this more as a party with a kind of fairly clear um, position on the ideological spectrum and a party that endures in terms of its institutions. What can be positive about that is if we think about the role that political parties play, you know, when we first talk to our students about political parties, we often say they have the role of integration and aggregating interests and funneling uh, the interests of citizens uh, to um, uh, 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 and tying that to the kind of policies that are then actually made by the government in power. This this importance of linkage, if you like. Um, so on the one hand, it can be very positive if you have long-standing parties um, that stand for something that's very clear what they stand for, particular kind of values, particular point on the political uh, spectrum. That could be really beneficial for a, a system. The distance and, and, and linking in with one of the final points that we were making about time horizons, these long enduring parties have the ability maybe to think more to the long term. So it can be a real positive. The problem is that it can also be a real negative if you have a very ossified, if you have a very kind of, uh, uh, um, and you have no kind of change within the party system. That can be very bad to not allow um, the party system to kind of respond to changing societies. So um, I don't know if, um, if this uh, uh, nursery rhyme fairy tale uh, translates to a Ukrainian audience, um, but um, uh, we have the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Um, and um, the story of whether the, um, uh, the, the, the porridge is, is too hot or too hot, sorry, I'll go for the bed, whether the bed is too long or too short or just about right. Um, and, you know, I would suggest that actually a really healthy party system is one that has a degree of change, um, allowing uh, it to reflect changing society uh, but not so much change that it doesn't have those kind of anchors that are really necessary to ensure the kind of linkage that's required. So uh, it shouldn't be too, 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 too big or too small, the amount of change, it should be just about right. Thank you. Um, Professor Degan Krause, do you have any comment on that? Um, I thought, uh, I think I think I can say it where Tim can't. Um, uh, I don't know that uh, 
um, you know, a, a long established party, um, if it's standing for the wrong things uh, and, you know, doing uh, things that are against a country's interest uh, can be a, quite a negative thing. So just being old doesn't, uh, doesn't make you uh, a positive, uh, uh, have a positive impact on the nation. Um, but what we do see is that, that um, you know, it, it is nice to have um, uh, at least a few parties in a system with some institutional memory, with some stability. Um, uh, we have some colleagues uh, in, uh, uh, in the UK and Hungary who've done research on um, the ability of parties to build lasting relationships, either positive or negative relationships with one another, so you know who's on what side. Um, and that seems to have a, a, some relationship to the success of, of democracy. Um, the other thing that Tim and I uh, worked on quite a bit on this book and will continue to work on, I think, for the rest of our lives, um, is the idea that uh, older parties tend to have an interesting um, uh, kind of composition. They tend to be composed of older uh, members who've been there for a while and younger members coming in. Um, and uh, in that process, you often see older members feeling a sense of responsibility to younger members, um, that uh, they, they owe them uh, the ability to keep the party running, to keep it working, uh, and, and also to do the same for the country, that they want a kind of long-term success. Um, when a party is just new, it often lacks that kind of generational diversity, um, uh, or at least those kinds of, of, of changes, slow changes over time in composition um, that give party what we call long time horizons, the ability to see farther out into the future. Um, most new parties, uh, look really at the first election, they look at the next election, but very few of those new parties really think about what are we doing to make sure that we're still around in 20 or 30 years. Um, that's bad enough, but if you can't do that, then it seems very difficult for you to say, what can we do to make sure our country or our ecosystem is still around in the next 30 years? Uh, and so um, we do have some significant worries uh, about the absence of age uh, in, in political uh, party systems in, in parliaments in this sense. I mean, the average, the absence of uh, a, a relatively mature institution that's able to, to be confident in its long-term survival, even if it takes unpopular positions, for example. So um, the, the news is mixed, but it does seem important to have at least a few parties that can take that longer view. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, so um, we are finished with our with questions from our Google Forms, and um, I can invite you to to ask questions to put them into our chat. Um, the the talk was fascinating. I, I'm just I'm just amazed. So um, because it pretty pretty much explains our situation in Ukraine. So may so can I can 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 we kind of as people are uh, are thinking about um, maybe asking some questions. So your your thoughts. I mean, um, obviously the Ukrainian case is interesting because um, you have you have an important divide in Ukrainian uh, history and politics, uh, which is which is regional, which is linguistic, um, which is about kind of orientation, uh, which are quite deeply rooted, I think, in, in um, Ukrainian politics. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, you know, as your uh, as that first question suggested, we've seen the emergence of quite a lot of these kind of uh, parties. Do you think that the parties that you were mentioning, you know, from self-help uh, um, uh, 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 voice, et cetera, et cetera, do you think that they do seem to be uh, very similar to a lot of these new parties that we've been um, talking about from the 11 cases um, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe? Do you see that there are really strong kind of parallels? And maybe, sorry, this is throwing it back to you, but it's a discussion. I'd be curious as to, what you think the expectation is of the longevity of a party like Servant of the People, yeah? Because this is a party that if 
we follow what we see in Central and Eastern Europe, we wouldn't really expect this party to survive very long if it follows the same kind of patterns. So, you know, is there much evidence that um, Zelensky and Servant of the People are managing to uh, prepare themselves and build more of a kind of a long-term success? Or is it still a big question mark for that party um, uh, at the moment? Um, that, that's a very good question. And um, I'm not an expert. Um, maybe my colleagues can can help me with uh, with with the answer. But I think that a servant of the people holds this pattern as um, as described in the presentation. So uh, I wouldn't expect it to um, to stay long in politics. But still, who knows? They pretend not to be to be corrupted and to be absolutely new people um so um i would put that as a question mark at least for me it is the servant of the people is falling apart already i mean a lot of previous party members who actually established the party have gone by now and they're changing the government constantly and the ministers. Have those people gone to form new parties or have they left politics? They have left politics by now, at least. Mm -hmm. Maybe they will form a new party at the next election. Okay. Does this seem to be true for other parties as well? I mean, you, you we, you know, the, the question from the Google form related to um, to self help, it related to uh, Golos. Um, I mean, have you seen the same kind of phenomenon of parties kind of coming and then proving um, incapable of doing what they promised or somehow losing their popularity and then going away? Yes, and the pattern repeats. Mm -hmm. and yeah, they, all, all parties lose their trust. Is there any reason, to, and I'm, I know I realize our job is to answer ask answer questions, not to ask them. But uh, it's really quite quite fascinating to us. So I mean, really, the only parties with a kind of continuity over time, um, uh, uh, really, is, is Timoshenko's party. There are a few others, smaller parties. But um, what accounts for the the persistence of of Timoshenko um, uh, when others have come and gone? Any ideas? That's really difficult to answer. Um, probably her social politics, like mm -hmm. social vector that she takes. And, um, but yeah, I think that kind of politics can um, help parties to survive. Uh, like, um, uh, that regional party mm -hmm. uh, was modified, but still they exist mm -hmm. and they, they have some votes. One of the things we often see is that many of the people stay in politics, but the parties they construct change around them almost by election to election. Um, and so, you know, you get one party block built around a certain person and that person sort of you know, leaves that party block or or re reshapes it, um, and so the same many of the same people are still involved in politics, but with very different, um, you know, with with somewhat different labels, with somewhat different structures. It looks like the Ukraine follows that kind of uh, um, space, and you know, especially in a in a in a in a country like Ukraine that's had some rather traumatic moments over the past decade. Um, um, partly in the you know in the fragmentation and 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 the destruction of what was one of the, the you know one of the largest political parties, um, and then on the other side you know the the collapse of a, a series of, of parties that were the opposition but now you know in government, 
Um, it, it suggests that this, at least our, our research suggests that this becomes a pattern for the long run, that it's actually very difficult to establish stability when you now have a tradition of instability. Um, you know, my guess is that most, uh, most of you um, may have never voted for the same party twice. Um, and indeed, many of your, your parents may have never voted for the same party twice. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, there was a long history of studies in the West where people would vote for the same party over and over. In fact, they would vote for the same party their parents voted for. Um, and so now in many countries, instead of a tradition of voting the same, you actually have a tradition of voting different, um, which has a very strong uh, negative impact on the, the stability of the party system. It doesn't mean the country collapses but it does change the institutional dynamics uh, and it makes it harder to find uh, a kind of, of stable equilibrium. And that can be a problem sometimes. So, oh, uh, I was just gonna just briefly add, so absolutely what Kevin was talking about, which is really interesting is this notion of uh, partisanship that we see in uh, long established democracies like the UK and the US where, where Kevin and I, um, uh, uh, zooming in from. But what's also interesting is thinking about kind of um, what causes longevity. I mean, there's an issue to do with party brands. So there's an interesting literature on Latin America, which talks about why some parties are able to endure and it's that they have a, a brand as Noam Lupi talks about, and it's sticking to that kind of brand. So they're known for doing something. And so it's interesting, Oksana, what you were saying, you know, about Timoshenko and social policy. So you could say maybe there's a sort of brand associated with it in a sense that people know, know what they're buying to use the kind of adapt, they use uh, the, 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 the language of sort of marketing and, and, and consumerism. Um, what's also uh, another interesting uh, factor to throw into the equation is about the issue of competence, about how well people perform when they get into into government and what we're seeing at the moment um i mean we haven't mentioned it but of course we're in the middle of a, a pandemic and what becomes interesting during pandemic and pandemic politics is that that citizens seem to become less kind of concerned about ideology per se and more concerned about well are there are the people in power actually competent and meeting the challenges that we face so we've seen interesting um, fluctuations of popularity of, of parties in the regions that we look at, but, but more broadly uh, linked into how well those political leaders are perceived to be doing in terms of responding to this, um, to this pandemic. Um, so, you know, that, that adds in a, another kind of factor or a couple of factors um, to think about in terms of um, uh, ephemerality or endurance of political parties. I think there was a question that came in. Yeah, um, so I'm going to read it. Um, the question is from Vitalia Bondarenko. Um, what do you think about new far right parties future, especially in Europe? Would they transform party systems into bipolar ones? As for example, Tim Bale wrote in some of his works, or oh, they are fated to die. and Referring to Ukraine, do you assume that similar examples would emerge as a strong power in Ukrainian parliament? Tim, do you want to do that one? Okay, so um, what do I think about far right parties' future? Um, uh, I think that um, what's important to say is I think that there is a, um, a constituency of voters that um, are inclined to vote for far right parties um, that they because of issues to do with migration and identity and the like there is a a group of voters who could be uh, persuaded to vote for far right parties um, one of the things that we perhaps didn't bring out so much in our presentation that we certainly talk about a bit more in our book is that the fate of political parties is uh, intimately linked into the choices that they make and the choices that their political leaders make um, as much as kind of underlying societal structures. So the fate of the far right 
um, is that there is there, there's a real potential for far right success, but success is going to be dependent on politicians in those individual countries being able to um, capitalize and mobilize that core vote um, for those kinds of parties. It's also, however, going to be heavily contingent on how the mainstream parties respond. So uh, Vitalia mentioned, for example, a scholar here, Tim Bale, great scholar. Um, we could mention also here maybe the work of um, a scholar called Bonnie McGeed, which is quite interesting. And Bonnie McGeed talks about how parties, lower right parties, their success is often heavily contingent on how the mainstream parties respond. And so McGeed says that basically the mainstream parties have three choices. They can either just ignore uh, the, the threat from, from the right and just hope that it goes away. Um, they can either confront and say uh, these uh, particular policies advocated by the far right are wrong for these reasons, or they can accommodate, they can take some of those policies and absorb them into their own. Um, and actually it's that last point that we see in a number of countries across Europe that some, for example, some of the more um, uh, harsher messages towards uh, immigration and, uh, and, and migrants and the like, quite a bit of that has been incorporated into some mainstream political parties. Um, and that actually means that it's, that there's fewer kind of votes there for the far right. That raises a whole bunch of interesting bigger questions. Um, but I think that that's important. So, um, so to, to answer more directly the question, sorry, Vitalia, to answer it's, will they transform? It's going to be hugely dependent on the choices that those party elites make and the choices made by the mainstream parties that they're competing against. Um, and the second part of your question, um, I'm going to be honest and say, I don't feel I know enough about Ukraine to give you a good answer as to what will happen in the Ukrainian case. But I would suspect that there is potential in Ukraine, um, uh, but that potential is going to be down to those far right parties and the mainstream parties and how they respond to um, uh, some of those underlying concerns that fuel the support for far right parties. I have nothing to add to Tim. Or oh, one. Kevin has just posted uh, Bonnie McGee's book. It's a very nice book. I use it with my students. Uh, I recommend. Um, it's a nice. Uh, it, it's a. It's a good argument as well to get your teeth into. I think. Oksana, I am afraid that I actually need to go over to another meeting. And I, I also realize we've taken quite a bit of your time, um, but um, I'm so grateful to uh, all of you for allowing us to, uh, um, uh, to talk to you today. Um, uh, I will put my email in the, uh, in the chat uh, and I would love to talk to any of you if you're interested in this. Um, uh, uh, I hope at some point in the not too distant future to get to Ukraine to do a bit of field work. Uh, for both Tim and I, uh, Slovak is our dominant uh, Slavic, Czech and Slovak are our dominant Slavic languages. So uh, Ukrainian is just a bit of a, of a stretch, but we can read and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and sometimes listen. Um, and uh, and the, the, the environment seems so familiar that it seems a shame that we, we haven't done more in, in your particular beautiful uh, country. So, um, so thank you all, uh, and uh, um, please do let us know if there's any way that we can uh, be of assistance, or if there's anyone who, who is interested in um, uh, political parties and wants to talk, or indeed is interested in uh, Fulbright and, uh, and wants some guidance on that. So, um, so I, Tim can stay, I need to duck out, but thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Degan Krause. That was um, amazing. Um, I'm so glad to have you here with us. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So I will see you all. See you. Okay. And I will just say, if, if, if anyone does have a, a final um, burning question, I'm very happy to try to to answer that, um, uh, I have a few minutes um, if, 
anyone does. I have one question. Yes, please. Uh, as your book is written now, and my question will be uh, about um, your own opinion about our parties. Maybe, uh, maybe some party you have that you like in Ukraine because you are professional and you have read a lot about our parties. You have seen a lot of texts, uh, leaders. Maybe you have uh, some party uh, which is interesting for you, only interest, only interesting, the best maybe parties. It's, it's difficult for you because uh, you, maybe you didn't uh, arrive to Ukraine, but you uh, have work, worked a lot in this so, field. So it's for me, as I'm a journalist, it's like a question um, with some interest because Fonera, who have read a lot of information, they have his, they, he has his own opinion. So can you answer? Okay, so uh, um, I would say, um, uh, I would say here a couple of things. I mean, firstly, um, uh, I, there's, there's scholarly interest and then there's what you might think of as as parties that you might uh, uh, align yourself to. I mean, uh, you know, politically, uh, I'm kind of a moderate liberal social democrat, um, ideologically. I don't know where that puts me in terms of Ukrainian politics, but um, uh, that's what that's 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 where my values uh, stand. Um, um, I don't know if there's a a party in Ukraine that fits uh, uh, fits that um, extremely well. Um, I, I I don't know. I I mean I would just emphasize I'm not an expert on you uh, on Ukrainian politics from a scholarly point of view. So this is not about where I would stand ideologically, but from a scholar. Um, uh, Servant of the people is a very very interesting phenomenon. Um, it really is a quite a fascinating phenomenon. Um, so I'm, I was interested in why Zelensky was successful in the first instance. Um, and I'm grateful to Mikita, if I pronounced that correctly, for um, some uh, for um, saying a little bit about what's happened with the party subsequently. Um, I'm not surprised by what Mikita said, um, but it's interesting to hear that he said that. So that is a party that I find interesting. The, the parties that were asked in that first question, I think are also really interesting. I mean, you know, a party voice, for example, that is very interesting because I gather, you know, it, the kind of anti-corruption appeal is very strong in that party. It's relatively new. It doesn't seem to have been around for very long. What's interesting is, you know, um, uh, Golas or Hlas in Slovak or Hlas in Croatian, we have quite a lot of parties that have been formed in um, uh, Central and Eastern Europe using this, because the word hlas, as you know, golas means not just voice, it means uh, a vote as well, right? Um, and that's true in many Slavic languages as well. So it's interesting as well, the names of parties, yeah? Um, what's one thing that we didn't mention in the presentation, but is very interesting is that so many of the newer parties that have been created in the last decade across Central and Eastern Europe don't have the word party in the name, right? It's interesting that there's a kind of reaction against party politics by not having the word party in the name. Instead, you take the name of voice or vote, or you take the name from the TV show that you were a star of, right? Or you take the name from somewhere else. So that is also really interesting um, to see how um, that has changed. And actually, we also see not so much, I don't think, in the Ukrainian case, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but elsewhere, we find it interesting that obviously the name of the person who founded the party is often there as well. 
and quite significant. Um, uh, um, we see that in a lot of kind of new parties, but those parties often have a problem because if they're then associated with one person, what happens in the future? Uh, if that one person falls under a bus or is involved in a corruption scandal or whatever, that's usually the end of the party. So, um, uh, you know, those are the sorts of parties that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. But I would also say to you, you're a journalist, but we've got some political scientists and social scientists and scholars here, is that, you know, we've just written a book about new parties and new parties are always very exciting and interesting. But it's also really important in politics that we understand why some parties have managed to hang around for a long period of time. And sometimes the really important part of understanding the politics of a place is understanding endurance and continuity as much as change. But yet in scholarship or in journalism or whatever, we often focus on change. So I would also say, you know, try to understand, uh, try to think about why we see endurance as well as seeing, seeing change. I mean, in the book, we do talk about endurance as well in one chapter. Um, um, but, you know, uh, the new party challenge is the slightly more exciting title than old parties that survive, right? Um, so it says something about scholarship and publishing. So I'm not sure if I answered your question that well, but um, uh, hopefully you've got something from what I was saying. Yes, thank you. I like your answer because uh, we, uh, Zelensky uh, is our president, so you say only good words. Thank you. Well, look, I'm I, but it's what's very important is I don't I don't know enough. I mean, what's very important in scholarship is that we shouldn't pass judgment unless we know enough about these things. And I can give you uh, my strong normative judgments on lots of politicians, but on Ukrainian politicians and politics, I would be cautious because um, I don't know enough to come to a judgment. But I certainly think the phenomenon is an extremely interesting one. And he's an interesting character. Yes. Um, thank thank you. you for your answer. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I think we are we are ready to wrap up. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Houghton. Um, I'm very grateful to Professor Degen Krause and for the whole discussion we we had here. Um, now we we have a fascinating event mm -hmm. coming up in our series on the 1st of June. This is going to be a talk by Professor Rappensperger of Wittenberg University, revising Kiev and Rus uh, for the 21st century. It focuses on some traditional assumptions about medieval Eastern Europe and challenges them. Uh, we've already announced it on our Facebook page and you are more than welcome to join us. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.